Jim Shooter is considered by many to be the most reviled man to ever work at Marvel Comics, so much so that his own staff revolted against him and then burned him in effigy. But to hear Jim Shooter tell it, he was never fired because of the things that he did at Marvel Comics. He was fired because he blew the whistle on corruption with Marvel executives. Let's talk about this. So as we get into this, we need to take a step back to the time before Jim Shooter was brought on as editor-in-chief, even hired by Marvel, and we need to talk about a guy named Sheldon Feinberg. So in the same way that Disney owns Marvel right now, Marvel had previously been owned by a company called Magazine Management Incorporated that was created by a guy named Martin Goodman. Martin Goodman sold everything to a guy named Martin Ackerman, who ran a company called Perfect Film and Chemical. Eventually, Martin Ackerman is ousted as CEO, and he's replaced by Sheldon Feinberg. Now, Sheldon Feinberg sits down, takes one look at Marvel, realizes how financially insolvent the company is. So he brings in a guy named Al Landau, and he tells Al, your job as the new president of Marvel, taking over for Stan Lee, who basically took off to Hollywood to form what you and I now call Marvel Studios, your job, Al Landau, is to get Marvel back to a state of financial solvency. But it turned out Al Landau was cooking the books. He was lying to Sheldon Feinberg about how much money Marvel was making. So Sheldon Feinberg Feinberg fires Al Landau, he brings in Jim Galton. And Sheldon and Jim sit down with Stan Lee and anybody else with decision-making authority under them and says, get it together or the entire company gets shut down and sold. So what led to these financial issues that Marvel was dealing with and how did they tie into Jim Shooter? So Marvel's financial problems stemmed from a variety of different places, but chief among them was how Marvel was running its company. One of the things to understand is that comics as they were sold back then were largely done through newsstands, malt shops, convenience stores, places where people would either buy periodicals or where young people would congregate and hang out or were most likely to visit. You did have your occasional comic book store, but it was wasn't nearly what it is right now. The reason why this is so important is because when Marvel creates a comic book, that comic is written by the writer and it's drawn by the artist. Then it's sent off to a letterer, the person who puts the letters into the speech bubbles, and the colorist, the person that fills in all the colors. Then it's sent off to the printers, and then it's sent to its destination where it just awaits to be purchased. The way in which Marvel got comics from point A to point B was a company called Curtis Circulation. Curtis Circulation was their distributor. The problem is that Curtis Circulation ultimately ended up going belly up. And so Marvel had to go to another company called Independent News in order to get their comics shipped from the printers to their destinations. Independent News was one of three companies that merged together, National Allied and All-American being the other two, which formed DC Comics. Marvel had to go to its competitor and ask its competitor to ship their comics for them. Now, all this happened under the original owner, Martin Goodman, but the fact remains that, of course, DC did what you would expect them to do. They limited the number of comics they were willing to ship for Marvel. Specifically, that number was eight. That comes off the heels of the first collapse of the comic book industry at the end of World War II, when superheroes stopped being popular, and the second collapse of the comic book industry in the mid-1950s, when a guy named Frederick Wortham published a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which convinced a good portion of the American public that comic books were corrupting kids. But focusing on the chief reason why Marvel was struggling financially, most of it had to do with late fees, and it was all due to how writers and artists were handling things within the company. The reality here is that even when a comic is effectively finished and is sent to the printers, there are deadlines there. If those deadlines are not met, fees are incurred. The way in which Marvel functioned at that point in time is that it was basically a clubhouse. DC Comics was very professional. You wore a tie, you wore a button-up shirt. It was very much down to business. Marvel had balloons hanging from the ceilings, sword fights in the hallways with toy swords, guys who were sleeping under their desks because they didn't actually have a place to live because downtown New York was so expensive. And so with Marvel operating as a frat house and creatives basically running the show, a lot of it just kind of came down to writing comics and drawing comics at times that worked best for them. Now you would think that the editors in chief at that point in time would keep all that sorted out. But the reality here is that when Stan Lee left the role of editor in chief, went to become president at Marvel, stepped down from that role and took off to Hollywood, he was succeeded by a handful of other people. And in no particular order, these guys were Roy Thomas, Marv Wolfman, Jerry Conway, Archie Goodwin, Len Wine. The issue here is that these guys 
didn't really want to be editors in chief once they got the job. What they realized is they just wanted to create comic books. The kicker about all this is that if a person became an editor in chief and then stepped down from that role, they got to enjoy something called the writer editor role. What it meant is they have no oversight. For those of you guys who were unfamiliar with how editors work, say for example that I'm writing an X-Men comic and in that comic book, I wanna have a story where Spider-Man teams up with the X-Men to defeat Magneto. My editor will go to the editor of Spider-Man and say, what's Spider-Man doing right now? And that editor will say, Spider-Man's in space with the Guardians of the Galaxy. So my editor will come back to me and say, you can't have Spider-Man in your story because he's supposed to be out there in space. It wouldn't make any sense for him to suddenly appear on Earth. That's called continuity. With the writer's editors and even other people who didn't enjoy the writer editor role, this continuity seemingly didn't have any bearing. They just wanted to write the stories that they wanted to write and didn't really concern themselves with what anybody else was doing. It's not to say everybody was doing that. There were certainly instances of writers following continuity, but by and large, this was a major issue. Built on top of that, Comic books were late all the time. So you might get the first issue of a comic in January, you might not get the second until March. And so with all these fees and this just inefficiency of the company operating the way that it was, this is the reason why when Sheldon Feinberg came in and eventually brought Jim Galston in, they said, get it together or get it shut down. Now, let's talk about Jim Shooter. So something to understand here is that Jim Shooter was basically a child prodigy. At 13 years old, he was recovering from surgery. During that point in time, he started reading Marvel comics and DC comics. And so what he did is he started sending off scripts for Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes to a guy named Mort Weisinger. What Mort Weisinger did as the editor of everything related to Superman and the reason why the Silver Age of Superman was so popular, Mort Weisinger brought Jim Shooter on and then not only had him writing scripts for comics, but had him proofreading and editing the scripts for comics that had been written by people who had been in the industry for 20 years. Keeping in mind, he's 14 years old at this point in time. The issue is that Jim Shooter did not like the management style of Mort Weisinger, which is interesting because he actually adopted that management style when he worked for Marvel, but we'll get to that here in a minute. But for Jim Shooter himself, because of the fact that the money that he was expecting to make, he wasn't really making, and because he wasn't really getting the notoriety he hoped to get, he ultimately quit. Now fast forward to Marv Wolfman operating as editor in chief at Marvel Comics. Marv Wolfman was barely holding the company together and he sent a few guys to go and find Jim Shooter because word had reached his ears about how capable Jim Shooter was. Jim's brought in as a proofreader, then an assistant editor, and then an editor. This guy's job was to do exactly what he did at DC Comics, to proofread the scripts being written by writers. This led to Jim Shooter earning the name troubleshooter because he would look over these scripts operating as an editor without actually being called an editor and say, this ending sucks, go back and rewrite it. This is not in continuity, go back and fix it over and over and over again. Now, as you guys can probably imagine, when it comes to creative types, they want to kind of create with a lot of freedom, not really have any restriction on them. With Jim Shooter, he was the opposite. Now, Jim Shooter, because of his capabilities, working as a proofreader and an assistant editor, made his way up the ranks to becoming an editor. But by this point in time, Marv Wolfman had long since left the role of editor-in-chief. Jerry Conway followed him, lasted about a month, and then Archie Goodwin took his place. But Archie Goodwin role as editor-in-chief, as he explained it to Stan Lee, was temporary. He only wanted the role until Stan Lee could find somebody else. But by this point in time, Sheldon Feinberg and Jim Galton had showed up to Stan Lee and said, get it together or get laid off. Everything that you're building in Hollywood is gonna be gone, sold off to whoever it is that wants to buy it. And so Stan Lee, looking at Marvel as a whole and seeing how effective Jim Shooter was, sat down with a meeting and said, do you wanna become the new editor-in-chief? Jim Shooter said, Yes. Now, Jim Shooter's time as editor-in-chief is marked by some of the greatest achievements in modern history with regards to the comic book industry, but one of the most reviled moments by writers and artists across the board. And here's what I mean by that. When Jim Shooter came on as editor-in-chief, and to hear John Byrne say it, Jim Shooter was great for the first two to three years, but he just stayed on too long. Jim Shooter got that ship right like that. He basically adopted the Mort Weisinger style. If you're late on your scripts, you're fired. If you're late on your artwork, you're fired. If you disagree with me, you're fired. There's my way or the highway because 
This is Marvel. We have some of the most popular titles currently being written. Uncanny X-Men, by that point in time, was more popular than Superman. And so the reality here is the line of people who want to write and draw for Marvel stretches out the front door and around the building twice. So get with the program or get out. This led to Marvel losing some of its top writers and artists. John Byrne, Gene Colan, Jerry Conway, Roy Thomas, Frank Miller, all these guys were fed up with Jim Shooter for a variety of reasons. Most of these had to do with the fact that Jim Shooter would change the work of people. A really good example of this is during Uncanny X-Men with the Dark Phoenix saga. And in fact, this is probably the most popular example. As a lot of you guys probably know, the Phoenix and Dark Phoenix stories are the stories where Jean Grey achieved godly levels of power. She went from being this damsel in distress under the old X-Men stories from Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Gary Friedrich, Roy Thomas, Arnold Drake, to become this godly powerful character under Chris Claremont. But at the end of the Dark Phoenix saga, because her actions had led to her destroying an entire star system, basically killing billions of people, that she was going to serve a kind of prison sentence for her crimes and then be let go. The response to Jim Shooter was, no, that's not gonna happen. She needs to endure just corporal punishment, whipping to the point where her skin's flayed off. Just this really, really, really dark stuff. And so Chris Claremont and John Byrne sit down together and they basically say, if that's the game that he wants to play, we're not playing it. He's done it with other people. We're writing and drawing the hottest selling comic on the market right now. We can do whatever we want. So they go to Jim Shooter and they say, if you don't let us tell the story that we wanna tell with Jean Grey, then we're just gonna kill her character. The response to Jim Shooter, Perfect, do it. Now it was a bluff, but ultimately Jim Shooter called it. And despite the protests of Chris Claremont and John Byrne, Jim Shooter's response, no, kill the character. Now, if you look up interviews from Chris Claremont at the time that happened, or with even a few years of that happening, he would swear up and down that Jim Shooter's one of the worst people to ever work at Marvel. But there was a recent interview that came out in a documentary on Amazon called Chris Claremont's X-Men, where he sits down and says, it was actually the right call to make. And it was, because it elevated Jean Grey's popularity in a way that just couldn't have been done otherwise. But these were the kind of changes that Jim Shooter was making, banning any depictions of homosexuality in comics any aggressive depictions of any kind of physical intimacy between characters. A lot of this was rooted in the fact that Jim Shooter believed in the Comics Code Authority, but the fact remains, writers and artists were frustrated because Jim Shooter was changing their work without their knowledge or forcing them to change it, despite the fact that they never saw a problem with it. On the other side, Jim Shooter probably did more to improve the lot for comic book writers and artists than anybody before him. He expanded royalties for comic book writers and artists. So they were making more money per comic than they had before he became editor in chief. That he worked alongside a guy by the name of Phil Seuling. Who's Phil Seuling? Phil Seuling was like an English teacher or a gym teacher or something like that. But because Marvel Comics was selling their comics through newsstands, malt shops, convenience stores, things like that, Phil Seuling had an idea where he said, when you sell your comics to newsstands, they pay wholesale price, a fraction of the cost. So if a comic costs a dollar for you and me to buy using arbitrary numbers, a wholesaler might pay like 50 cents or 40 cents. The downside to this and the nature of the business model was that if any one of these stores purchased like 100 issues of Spider-Man, but they only sold 50, they could send the other 50 back for a refund on their wholesale price, or they could tear the cover off. And because it's a damaged comic, they send it back for more than the wholesale price, but a discounted price based on what the consumer would purchase. They were ripping Marvel off. Phil Seuling had pitched an idea to Roy Thomas that didn't come to fruition until he spoke with Jim Shooter. The idea is that Phil Seuling and people like him would buy comics from Marvel at a wholesale price, but whatever comics they didn't sell, they would just be stuck with. This led to the direct market and the eventual comic book store. Jim Shooter was one of the guys that helped to make this happen. Because of things like this, Jim Shooter changed the comic book industry in a lot of positive ways, not just for writers and artists, but also for the consumer. But at the end of the day, the strict way in which he was running Marvel ran off writers and artists and pissed off the writers and artists who stayed there. And so, as we mentioned in the intro, John Byrne held a barbecue at his house. A bunch of writers and artists showed up. They took a doll, stuffed it with copies of a comic called New universe and then put Jim Shooter's face on it and burned it in effigy. Here's the kicker to all of this. Jim Shooter would argue that none of that was the reason for why he got fired. That what Jim Shooter did is he went to the CEO of New World Entertainment, the movie studio based out of Hollywood, 
Why? Because by this point in time, Perfect Film and Chemical Corporation had been rebranded to Cadence Industries. But what Jim Shooter claims to have realized is that the upper management, Sheldon Feinberg, Jim Galton, and those guys were using Marvel Comics as a way to lay off business expenses for any of the other subsidiaries of Cadence Industries. What it did is it gave the illusion that Marvel was worth less money than it was. And so Sheldon Feinberg, Jim Galton, and those guys sold Marvel Comics to New World Pictures, but they sold it for something like $45 million. But because of how Marvel Comics appeared, shareholders got a pittance of what the shares were actually worth, something like $17. And the rest of the money was pocketed by Marvel's upper management. According to Jim Shooter, he went to the New World Pictures CEO, Bob Ream, and said, here's what's going on, this is a problem. But because he bypassed the upper management at Marvel and went directly to the CEO, the upper management, fired him on the spot. And to hear Jim Shooter tell it, he had a meeting with Bob Ream. And Bob Ream's response, yes, we know you're right, but the reality here is we just bought Marvel Comics. We can't fire upper management. What would the shareholders think? Now, how much of that is true? I don't entirely know, but that's supposedly the story of why Jim Shooter was canned from Marvel Comics, that it had nothing to do with how he was treating the comic book staff, writers, artists, and the strict adherence to the rules that he was creating. Supposedly, it had everything to do with the fact that he blew the whistle on corruption at the upper levels of Marvel management. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Let me know what you think about videos like this, and I will catch you all later. Peace.